pray, and uh, we'll dive into uh, to Genesis this morning. Father, thanks for a beautiful morning. Thank you for being so good to us. Your grace, your mercy, your faithfulness is, is just staggering, and it is a true pleasure and honor to be here in this place, not only with these folks, but Lord, with you. You've chosen to meet us today. And we consider that a gift. We never want to take it for granted. So thank you for this morning. Guide us, direct us, may you be glorified in all that's said and done. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Marriage. Marriage is what brings us together today. Oh, yes, yeah, so good. Buttercup and Wesley, right? Uh, who has not seen that movie? Let's just confess sin right now. Are you kidding me? I would say let's just cancel church right now and watch Princess Bride. That's how important this movie is, so. So, so no joke, really. I, I do, I, I officiate a lot of weddings, and uh, I had one couple several years ago who just, they were just movie fanatics. They said, we want you to be the minister from Princess Bride. I said, I'm totally down for that. I am, so I welcomed everyone. I said, marriage, and I did, and I did not break character literally for that long, and all of a sudden people were like, does, does this guy really talk like this? And then once I broke character, you can tell just all the, the, uh, all the pressure was off, right? People were like, okay, good. This is back to normal. So, marriage, love, true love, which brings us together. Genesis 2. We're going to talk about marriage today. And um, marriage is such an important topic, and it is a, it's an urgent topic to address. And uh, we just so happen to come to Genesis 2 where we have the first marriage introduced to the world. And I think it would just serve us all well to look at the topic of marriage, look at the topic of the role and responsibility of husband, role and responsibility of wife over the next few weeks. So we're going to take a deep look into Genesis 2 and unpack the ramifications of the topic of marriage. And this is good no matter where you're at. When it comes to marriage, if you've been married or in divorce, or if you're currently married or you're not yet married, the stuff that we are going to talk about impacts all of us. And I'm going to tell you right now that it, no matter where you're at with marriage, and especially for those that have perhaps been married and are divorced, um, none of the things we talk about, whether it be today, next week, or, or any time, there is no topic that is beyond the forgiveness of God in our lives, okay? You need to know that because I think the church has done a horrendous job of really condemning people, excluding people, and acting as if if you've been divorced, that's the unforgivable sin. And I want you to know that God has the power to heal all hurt. God has the power to heal those areas that have uh, perhaps ravaged our lives. And the church has done a disservice to people uh, when it comes to just general areas of sin in our life. There is no sin that God's grace cannot cover. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So you need to know that. So I don't want anything I say, and I'm praying that the Spirit would guide the words and direct us to the truth that we have today, we can't change yesterday, but we have today, and I believe that God's Word and God's Spirit is aimed to have us have hope for tomorrow. So no matter where you've been, no matter what you've gone through, there is hope and there is healing. Amen? Uh, because I want us to have a marriage. So Barbara Bush died this, this past week, 92 years of age. Her and George were married 73 years. Can you imagine that? And, and that's the topic when it comes to Barbara Bush passing away. It seems like every news story I read about her 
emphasizes right at the start that she and George were married for 73 years. I've been married 26, and I think that's a lot. If you ask my wife, she probably goes, it feels like double that time, right? And the fact that she's been married to me that long qualifies her for sainthood. So just so you guys know, but 73 years. See, there's something within all of us that want a marriage to last 73 years. There's something within our culture, because we read that, we hear that, we say we want that. And I, as a pastor, would do you a disservice not to emphasize some of the key things that would make a marriage last 73 years. I, as a pastor, would do you a disservice if I didn't instruct you men, what does it mean to be a husband? What does that look like? And give you tools so that you can grow in this area. I would do you a disservice, ladies, if I didn't show you what the Bible points to as far as instructions for wives. Because God is the designer of marriage. He is the creator of marriage. And because I think we've drifted from His purpose and his picture of marriage is the reason we've ended up with a culture that is fraught with 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 damaged relationships amen so we turn to genesis 2 we have a picture here of adam and eve man and woman in the garden and there is so much some and like i said i do a lot of weddings i've i've done weddings where i i could not even estimate how much how much it costs to pull off the 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 ceremony i've done a wedding probably one of my favorite weddings was an all-you-can-eat crab leg bar at the Arizona Biltmore. And there were hundreds of people there. And all I'm thinking is dollar signs. Like, what does this baby cost, right? And, and, and I think that's part of the problem. So much time and money is spent on the wedding ceremony. How much money and time is spent on the marriage? I mean, if you think about it, how much people go into debt to have the most amazing ceremony, and yet they are def- Efficient in the area of what will it take to make our marriage last. See, someone once said that if the wedding is the dream, well, marriage is the alarm clock. But it's time to wake up. Reality, right? The, in fact, statistics say that 64% of the friends involved in a wedding ceremony believe the couple will eventually divorce. They are standing up there saying, hey, you know what, I love these guys, but you know it's not going to last. Even the closest friends believe it's not going to make it. And they're right on target. 65% of new marriages don't make it. Another 10% of couples will stay together for various reasons, but will be miserable. So in other words, a typical marriage today has a 75% failure rate. That's why this is important. I mean, would you let your children fly on an airplane that had a 75% failure rate? Would you get on a plane? Would you get into a car if you knew it had a 75% chance to crash and burn? Would you get in the vehicle? Not at all. See, we live in a culture that, uh, I mean, it's strange. You actually have to jump through more hoops to get a driver's license than you do a marriage license. At least with a driver's license, there's a, there's a competency test involved, isn't there? And I'm sitting there going, what is going on with our relationships? I'm going to tell you right now, and this is something we're going to come back to time and time again over these next few weeks. The root problem in marriage is one word. You guys ready for this? Write it down. The word that is worth gold, but the word you need to think about because it's going to save your relationship. The root problem in marriage selfishness preach it brother matter of fact i couldn't print this any bigger tim keller gave us wise instructions he said this if each spouse says to the other i will treat my selfishness as the main problem in the marriage you have the prospect for great things Maybe this should be a part of the marriage vows. You know, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. I actually did a wedding last week where they said for richer, for richer. And there was joking, of course, right? But the issue is this. And those of you who have been married for any significant amount of time, is this not the truth? See, marriage has this uncanny way to 
provide an environment to show you how truly selfish you are. And if you think it's not about you and you want to continue to point fingers at the other person, you'll never have a relationship that is going to be blessed by God. Barbara Whitehead wrote a book called The Divorce Culture. She, she said this, Americans began to change their ideas about the individual's obligation to family and society. Broadly described, this change was away from an ethic of obligation to others toward an ethic of obligation to self. This is what she writes in her book, The Divorce Culture. Uh, William Bennett said it this way, Modern marriage has been detached from any objective foundation and is now generally viewed as possessing little or no intrinsic worth, but as being a means to an end. The end, that is, of personal happiness or fulfillment. In the quest for fulfillment, spouses and children are often looked upon not as persons to be loved and valued for their own sake, but as objects to be acquired, enjoyed, and discarded. Unfortunately, we have, live in a day when personal rights have won out over personal responsibilities. We live in a day where uh, wants have won out over needs. Till death do us part has been replaced by as long as I'm happy. And so marriage is now convenience-based rather than commitment-based. Commitment equals covenant. It's what we talked about last week. If you missed the, the message, you can get it online. Right, Josh? It's up, ready to go. Thanks to the tech team. All right. Covenant means you will be committed no matter what may come your way. Francis de Salas said it this way, the state of marriage is one that requires more virtue and constancy than any other. It is a perpetual exercise of mortification. What does that mean? It means it's a continual exercise in dying to yourself. So I have three goals in mind for today and the next few weeks. Number one, I want to comfort you that these messages are going to encourage you if your marriage is hurting. Number two, I want to convince you that I am here to tell you that it is possible to have a great marriage. I'm not going to tell you you're going to have a perfect marriage, but I can tell you how to have a great marriage. A lot of people say it's impossible today. I'm going to tell you it's not. You can have a marriage that's more fulfilling than you ever imagined. And number three, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to correct some of the ways you thought about marriage. I want, you to I want to challenge you with some of the thinking you have in your current relationship that are perhaps causing the problems. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you to, to fight. Too many couples throw in the towel too, or, too early. And when I talk to couples, when I counsel or mentor husbands and wives, we don't talk divorce. I talk fighting. Fighting for what's important. Fighting to learn the lessons God has for that person. Fighting for the relationship. Because that's how God shows his love towards us. He fights for us. And we're going to get to that here in a moment. Is divorce ever an option? Because here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying you stay in a relationship that perhaps is abusive. I've dealt with men and women in abusive environments, and we've, we've counseled them and coached them accordingly. I would never encourage a woman or children to be in an environment where there is a, a threatening presence that something physically can horribly happen. I would never encourage that. But I will tell you that God can even work in those scenarios and those situations. And I've seen it happen. I've seen people divorce and come back together and get remarried. I've had couples separate and work on their issues and then come back and get recommitted to each other. I've seen God heal. The question is, will we fight for what we believe is important because God is glorified in those moments? A great marriage is made up of two great forgivers. Don't forget that. A great marriage is made up of two great forgivers. So Genesis chapter 2, turn there if you would. We're going to finish out the chapter 
this morning, and then we're going to build upon it in the next couple weeks as we talk about husbands, wives. And again, this is applicable information for everybody, no matter what your marital status is. So, verse 18, God said, it is not good, chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 18, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him, one that corresponds to him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. What an incredible responsibility as man is showing his dominion over what God has created. He is the one that God has put in control. He is managing God's affairs. He is showing his kingship, his earthly kingship by naming the creatures. And man gave name to all the cattle and all the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. All the other animals had companions. All the other animals had a corresponding equal. And yet there was something missing in his own experience. So the Lord God, verse 21, caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And this, for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. So foundational truth. Marriage is God's creation. Marriage is the first and most basic of all human institutions. Ethnologists and anthropologists find evidence continuously and for ages that show that monogamous Permanent marriage has everywhere and in all ages been considered as the ideal and preferred form of family life. This is the way it's been for a thousand years. One man joined to one woman that now become one flesh for one lifetime. That's marriage. Any other definition is not biblical marriage. So let me say that again. You want to write that down. One man plus one woman plus one flesh, what they become together for one lifetime. You see how all the ingredients are there, right? Male, female, sex in this context, but even beyond sex, incredible depth of intimacy and relationship forever. That's biblical marriage right there. Though cultures come and try to redefine that, though powers in control try to redefine that, and while we as followers of Christ perhaps live in cultures that maybe we disagree with, we disagree agreeably. Meaning I don't accept your definition of marriage But I will live in a context that says, this is how we're going to define it. Fine, you define it like that, but here's how God defines it. But if I am called to submit to a definition I don't agree with, then there's a place for civil disobedience. Because it is our job to honor God more than we honor man. Amen? Tough words to say in a culture that seems to be continually distancing itself from God's ideal. But isn't it interesting, the more we distance ourselves from God's ideal, the more problems, the more sin, the more chaos, the more havoc, the more, the more craziness. And people sit there and go, I don't know what the problem is. Gee, I wonder why our world looks like a big train wreck. Because you're trying to live your life apart from the original design. 
and I will sit down with someone who may not agree with what I am stating this morning, but I will do it in a loving and compassionate way and say, this is the way that makes sense. And I don't know what you're struggling with or what you're feeling or what, what this is stirring inside of you, but you know what? All I know is sometimes, we, I'm going to say all the time, we have to submit to something maybe we don't understand or something we, have to, we don't necessarily agree with. Amen? Sometimes the Bible presents something to us that we don't want to have to face, but this is what God has said. And so, if marriage falls... All other institutions will fall as well. Because marriage is the first and most basic of all institutions. If this is destroyed, all other earthly institutions are sure soon to follow. That's why this is important. The only other institution ordained by God is, does anyone know? Church. There's only two institutions in the world ordained by God. Marriage and the church. And what is significant about that truth is that both of these institutions are to be led by men. Now I'm going to say something that might be controversial. I'm going to say something that may not be accepted by all, but this is the design. That the home is to be led by men. This does not say that women cannot be leaders. But there has to be a primary responsibility falling on somebody to take the initiative, to take the leadership role. Because if there's no head, it's dead. And if there's two heads, it's a monster. And we don't want either one of those. Amen? But the same is true for the church. The church clearly outlines that men and women can serve as leaders in God's church, but when it comes to the role of elder in the church, it is clearly a role for males to fulfill. Because if there's no head of the church, it's dead. And if there's, more, if there's two heads, it's a freak, right? The home and the church are to be led by men. Women play an important role in both those institutions. Women serve as leaders of those institutions. Women initiate in those institutions. Women have, you, if you think women just sit passively by and don't contribute, look at my wife, please. My wife is as stubborn, as strong-willed, as hard-headed as I am. And yet what she brings to the table in our marriage is valuable. What she brings to the culture of this church is valuable. But at the end of the day, God holds me to be responsible for the nature and temperature of my home. And as a pastor and elder of this church, God holds me responsible along with the other elders, men who love Jesus, who want to lovingly lead this church as Christ is leading us. He holds us responsible for the culture, the temperature of this church. And again, that doesn't negate a woman's input. That doesn't negate a woman's role of of influence and and leadership. I mean, look at the life of Jesus. How many women traveled with Jesus and were an important part of his ministry? Read Romans 16 and look at how many women the apostle Paul mentions and says, look who was a part of my inner circle. So I don't agree with the whole Da Vinci Code Dan Brown theology of church history where the church suppressed women. It did not. Women were such a vibrant part of the early church that it is clearly scripted for us in the Bible. And so with everything I'm saying, don't, I don't want you to hear that women don't play an important role. Women play an important role. But it's understanding that even in our equality, as all men and women are created in the image of God, in equality, there is differences. Question is, how will we leverage those differences for the glory of God? And that's what we're going to talk about over these next few weeks. So foundational truth, marriage is God's creation. Three things I want you to notice. Number one, the significance of marriage. Number two, the sanctity of marriage. And number three, the spirit of marriage. And let me also say, just as far as interjection at this point, If there's any question you have on this topic or something I may address or something I maybe I'm not clear on, please use the communication card and jot down a note. 
throw out a question, throw out a, con- and I would love to even in the coming weeks deal with those, take a, just a couple minutes out and say, hey, I had this come through, I want to address this. So if I'm unclear on something or you want further clarity on something or there's something maybe I said that wasn't necessarily um, properly understood or maybe I misconstrued it, God's word is infallible, I am fallible. Amen? So please submit question, comment, because I want you to be on top of this stuff. I want you to understand God's heart in all this. So number one, there's the significance of marriage. Notice how Genesis 2 starts. It is all God's doing. God brings the animals. God allows Adam to name the animals. God's the one who uh, says this is not a good situation. It wasn't that Adam complained. You have no complaint from Adam. Um, God... There's a lot of creatures down here on earth, but there's not one that looks like me. It wasn't like God was answering some complaint. Adam was just sitting there like doing his deal. And his, but all of a sudden, there's this, this, this hunger for relationship. And, and isn't this true for every single human being? Isn't loneliness one of the most awful things for any human being to experience? We were created for relationship. And so there's this hunger inside Adam, and God sees it. And God is the one who declares it in his sovereign, unilateral assessment of the situation. God says, it's not good that man's alone. So this is all God's doing. And so what we see here at the very start is the deficiency of man. The deficiency of man. That man is lacking something. That man is incomplete. That there is something that is not good And so what does God do? He steps in and he brings a corresponding valuable help to make the picture complete. And so what does God do? He creates a helper suitable for Adam. Here we have the dignity of woman. So you have the deficiency of man, now the dignity of woman, and now you have the significance of marriage. So God causes this deep sleep to fall upon Adam, pulls one of his ribs out, and no, it's not true. Men have one less rib than women. Don't believe the lie. Even my kids the other day at dinner were like, is it true men have one less rib? I'm like, it's not true. But at this moment, God takes one of his ribs. Now, here's the interesting thing. God creates man out of the dust. But woman is now the first living being created from another human being takes the bone, takes the flesh, takes the DNA, takes all the components that make us human, and he creates this first person from another living being. And he has created her to correspond to him so that they now have the vocation of multiplying, filling the earth, and having rulership over the earth. They both have the opportunity to enjoy the garden. They both have the opportunity to respect the prohibition to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that's put in the center of the garden. Do you see how they are equality on, there's so much equality on so many levels. See, the fact that she is able to bear children, but it doesn't factor in at this moment, tells us that she is valuable for who she is, not for what she does. Notice that this woman is a helper for man. This word helper is used 16 times in relation to woman, and it appears 19 times in the Old Testament, signifying her essential contribution, not her inadequacy. We hear helper, and we think, oh, she's, she's subordinate to the man. She is inferior to the man, and that is not true. It's the same word Jesus uses for the Holy Spirit in John 14 when he says, I'm going to send a helper to you. So this word is incredibly valuable, and in, it, it talks about just her intrinsic worth. What he lacked, she supplies. And what she lacked, he supplied. And together as male and female, they both now reflect the image of God. And that's the message. That me as a man cannot fully reflect the image of God in my life. There is a complementary partner that I have where now together we can do it. Unless we forget that men and women are equal before God and we stand on level ground before the cross, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, write that verse down. That in Christ, there is neither male nor female. 
In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. In Christ, there is neither slave nor master. In Christ, there is neither circumcised nor... In Christ, we are all equal. Why? Because you have intrinsic worth simply because you as a male, you as a female have been created in the image of God. Amen? And so while there is equality in our personhood, there are differentiations in our roles. And we must be clear on this. So here's woman, and God waits for the perfect time to bring woman into man's life. It's almost like he, 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 at, at every passing of an animal, the deep hunger grows, right? As each animal passes, I mean, we start with aardvark, we f- finish with zebra there's, a, zebra, there's a lot in between. And with every passing of these creatures, his hunger for relationship grows. And I think it's because the first lesson at God wants to teach Adam is for him to appreciate woman in his life. And so at the right time, God steps in and creates this woman. And I love how one author puts it. He puts it this way. The woman was not made from a bone out of the head of Adam to top him, nor was a woman made from the bone from his feet that she should be trampled upon by him. But a bone was taken out of his side to be equal with him under his arms to be protected by him and near his heart to be beloved by him. Not from Adam's head to suggest superiority, not from his feet to suggest inferiority, but from his side because that signals equality and companionship, which brings us to the sanctity of marriage. So now here's the holy moment, right? This is the wedding event of all wedding events puts bachelor to shame puts princess die of uh, princess die and prince charles to shame you remember when that happened 1981 i remember watching it as a kid going why all the hype right like a, a train on her dress that was so long like it went like city blocks right and all these people gathered and you know marriage is a big event but here we have the first one and the question is oh, i wonder what her colors are i wonder what her dress looks like Well, guess what? There's no colors. There's no dress. They're totally naked. And who is it that walks her down the very first aisle? It's God himself. Look at verse 22. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken and from the man, and he brought her to the man. Now now put yourself in this moment if you can. Here is man. And who knows if he's just like tired, like running through all the letters, naming all the animals, and he's just fatigued, right? And all of a sudden, you know, he wakes up from this deep sleep. He doesn't know what happened. And that sometimes the mystery of God happens when we're not paying attention and we're not even aware of it. Something miraculous happens when we're not even, like, we can't even see it. But all he knows is he wakes up. He's probably got a little itch right here, like, man, what's going on? With, you know? And all of a sudden, God brings the woman to man. Now, if I was officiating the wedding, I'd say, who is it that gives this woman to be joined with this man, right? But there's none of that. There's a holy moment in this temple garden scene where there's this first marriage happening. And this is showing us this this sanctity of marriage, the wonderful stage that has been set of God playing the role as father, walking the woman down to give the man his wife. And she is presented holy as a partner and counterpart. She is valuable. Here you go, man. Here is woman. And then we have the first love song ever written. Right? The first love song. This is, this is an expression of ec- ecstasy. This is an expression of a song from Adam's heart. And what does he say? He says, Oh, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. These are the first and only recorded words of Adam before the fall in Genesis chapter 3. His declaration of praise for a companion that he goes, now she's like me. All the other creatures, there was no similarities. But now there is one that is like me. And now they are brought together for an unconditional commitment to each other forever. You are never more like God in your relationship than when you are on your wedding day, when you commit yourselves unconditionally to one another. And that's what happens here. She is brought to man. 
which then sets up the spirit of marriage. Look at verse 24. And here they are. This man has left his home, father and mother. He's going to cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. There's leaving, there's cleaving, and there's this joining. Now, what's amazing is, obviously, he has no father or mother to leave from, right? But obviously, God is setting up a prescription for all future relationships between a man and a woman. He has given us a picture. This is why Jesus, in Matthew 19 and Mark chapter 10, refers to this verse to emphasize his endorsement of marriage between a man and a woman to be one flesh for one lifetime. This is why people will say, well, Jesus didn't have anything to say about homosexual marriages, and Jesus didn't. He affirms what's going on in Genesis. He says, this is what Moses wrote, this is what God has given to us, and this is what marriage is. And this is why he refers to it. A man shall leave his home, he shall cleave to his wife, they shall become one flesh forever. That is the essence of all God-honoring marriages. What do these things mean? Write the three words down. Leaving, cleaving, joining. Leaving means that as you set out on a life now with this newfound loved one that you're committing yourself to, this means that you are no longer leaning on your families, you are not giving them an opportunity to try to control your relationship. The influence of what they've had in your life is important, but you are now forming a home of your own. The ongoing influence is important, but you don't let mom and dad dictate your new relationship that you are now designed to to figure out now on your own. I married a couple one time that the issue between them was the fact that her mom required her to call her every single night. And I sat there and said, you've got to sever that. There is no longer an umbilical cord attached between you and your mama. Right? There's this severing that has to happen. Again, not that you don't love your mom, but you have to focus now on the new home that God has given to you with your husband because he was irritated, right? Can you imagine that? Like, you know, you're, you're hanging out with your wife all of a sudden, there's the call from mom. What it means is you have to sever that relationship. There's no longer an umbilical cord attached. It means also, ladies, you don't compare your husband's to your dad and what he used to do or what he did well. Like, in my, my, my father-in-law, I love him. This guy is a mechanical genius, right? He can make things and he can fix things. And I'm not like that. Like, if it can't be fixed with duct tape, it's, it's beyond repair in my world. Praise God for duct tape, right? But the moment my wife says, well, you can't fix, well, my dad growing up fixed things. All, and all of a sudden now, there's this, oh, now you're comparing me with your dad. Well, I'm not your dad. And all of a sudden, there's a fat fight, right? Or, you know, Thanksgiving rolls around, and it's like, well, my mom used to make this, and you're not making it. All of a sudden, my wife's going, really? You see how the the, the leaving sometimes doesn't happen in marital relationships when you start talking about your mom, your dad, their marriage, and all of a sudden, you are not free to form a home of your own? You have to leave. Again, not that mom and dad don't have influence, not that you don't have relationship with them, but you've got to venture out and learn things on your own. Amen? But the cleaving is important. See, not that the leaving is is the only thing you need, but now you need to be joined, and the word cleave literally means like you're super glued. You are committed to each other. And what this means is that there's a permanence in in your relationship with your spouse that says this is unbreakable. That no matter what may happen, you and I are joined together. We are cleaved. We are superglued. And nothing's going to separate us. 
That's why at the end of a wedding ceremony, I'll say to the, the, the audience, you know, hey, what God has brought together today, let no man separate this union. This is the idea of permanence in your relationship. And I'm going to tell you right now that you as a husband, you as a wife, need to constantly speak words of permanence into the situation. You need, to, you need to communicate words that this is important. I will fight for this. I will tooth and nail make this the most important thing in the world. And that's what it is. Outside of your relationship with God, your marriage is the most important relationship in the world. My primary ministry is to my wife. My wife comes before you. My wife comes before my children. And trust me, I affirm that with them all the time. The moment one of my boys back talks my, my wife, you know who you're talking to? I don't say your mom. I say that's my wife. Too many homes have become child-centered. And we wonder why marriages are going down the tubes. Your primary, primary ministry is to your wife. Your primary disciples are your kids. My ministry is my wife. Our disciples are our children. My wife comes first. And in 26 years of marriage, I have never uttered the word divorce to my wife. Because divorce communicates, I'm not committed. Divorce communicates, we're not super glued. Divorce communicates, we're not cleaving. Divorce communicates, I'm not willing to work on this. That doesn't mean we haven't fought. That doesn't mean we haven't battled. We fought yesterday. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to be very transparent with my role as a husband and especially my wife's role as a wife. You know, I'm going to be very transparent about her stuff. So just kidding. <laughs> but I will be, my wife has given me liberty to share about our marriage. And I'm, and I'm not up here to say, boy, it's just so perfect. It's not. We were, we were at each other's throats. Literally yesterday, we said to each other at least four or five times, What's up with your attitude? She said it four times, I said it once. <laughs> Not that we're keeping a ledger. Here's the thing. My wife knows I will fight for her. And I will do whatever it takes to communicate that in my words, in my, my temperament, in my body language, whatever it takes... She knows I am for her. And when problems come up, the question is not, what's it going to take for me to get out of this marriage? The question is this, what's it going to take for me to make this marriage better? Because it's not about her, it's about me. Every single time. Don't miss that. That's gold right there. That's gold. Jerry, that's gold. <laughs> the, merit, the problems in marriage stem from your own heart. Right? That's why Jesus says, when pressed by his disciples who have a very low view of marriage, he says, the reason Moses permitted divorce is because the hardness of your hearts. Nailed it again. Yeah, Jesus gets it right all the time, doesn't he? Permanence. The stick to itiveness in your relationship. The commitment to say, we will persevere. And just the moment you feel like throwing the towel is the moment you need to press in harder. I was listening to NPR radio the other, yesterday, and they had the guy who invented the Dyson vacuum cleaners, right? Valued at, like, 10 billion dollars or something he and his wife are celebrating 40 plus years of marriage this year and listening to him, i just like listening to his accent you've seen him on the commercials right like i don't have a dyson but if you want to bless my family with a dyson vacuum cleaner we're more than willing to accept a dyson but he said with anything that is important and he felt like this was important because he started this uh this business 16 years ago he said there are the moments that I felt the pressure, and it was hurting, and it was painful. But he goes, those are the moments some people would throw in the towels. He goes, those are the moments I knew I had to press in. When those issues arise, it's not about fleeing. It's about fighting. 
And you need to press into those moments. Amen? Because when you leave father and mother, and when you cleave to your spouse, what is the result? The joining, the one flesh. You are naked and not ashamed. This goes beyond physical nakedness. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you have a relationship that is based upon how good sex is, that is a relationship that is going to fall. You don't get married to somebody because they're good in bed. Amen? Matter of fact, you do not know they're good in bed until the night of your honeymoon. You save yourself. And you can sit there and call me a Puritan. You can call me old school. But God has reserved sexual union between a man and a woman to be reserved for that wedding night because what a picture of covenant making you're making with each other. And every time I have sex with my wife, I am reaffirming the covenant that I am committed to her. Now, we don't say that when, it, when the moment happens. Just so you go, like, honey, time to make the covenant. Time to ratify the covenant. Time to, you know, it, it's not that, right? But <laughs> I told you, this is, this is, my wife's not here. She has nothing to say about it, so. But I will tell you, oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Tech team, give it up for the tech team. I'm sure there's some way they can go back and say, let's just kind (laughs) of, no, it's all good. But it's true. Ladies and gentlemen, you are not to have sex with somebody outside outside the context of marriage. Sex is reserved for you to share with someone of the opposite sex that you are now committed to before God and witnesses. That is the moment you have sex. You save yourself till marriage. You can do it. I did it. And there was no, more, no one more hormonally charged than me as a teenager. This is why I got married just as I turned 22, because I couldn't wait any longer. Believe it or not, my wife and I were both virgins when we got married. And this was the era of Def Leppard and White Snake. I know, believe it or not, the, the, God can do miracles, right? But that doesn't mean if you've had sex before marriage, that's the unforgivable sin. Remember what I said at the beginning? Right now, save yourself. Because every time you join yourself to someone who you are not maritally connected or committed to, you're losing something of your spirit and your soul. And this is not the way God's designed it. He has designed it for you to be one flesh physically with someone of the opposite sex you've committed to in a marital relationship. This is the way it is and this is the way it will always be. But the one flesh is so much more than the physical. See, the sex is the result of emotional connection, mental intimacy, relational bonding. See, the greatest sex organ on a woman is her mind. Men were on off, right? Tick, okay, here we go, right? Like, we, it's purely like this physical drive, right? But for women, it's like, you know, there's a book that was written years ago, Sex Begins in the Kitchen, right? Talk to me about your day. Let's process what happened, right? You're engaging emotionally. You're connecting mentally. You're engaging relationally. And then all of a sudden, like, sex happens, right? But see, you have to understand that what is happening here is a connection between two people where there's no shame, there is no guilt, There is no condemnation, and they are accepting one another as they are with who they are. And there is no room in any marital relationship for shame, for guilt, for condemnation, for judgment. You want to make your relationship better to your spouse? Tell you what, get rid of all those things that don't look like the Spirit of Christ and begin to be gracious and begin to be merciful and begin to be compassionate and kind. Don't attack one another. This, my wife is my greatest cheerleader, but she's also my toughest critic. But we are in a context where I know she wants what's best for me and I want what's best for her. And we're a team. And we're going to fight this thing together. And so what I'm going to encourage you guys with is this, that you are to be one flesh with your spouse. There is to be a transparency and vulnerability where and I'm going to talk about this more in the roles and responsibilities of husbands and wives in the weeks to come, that is going to lead to this this union that is just going to be so special, so amazing, so magnificent, that the world doesn't know how to treat their marriage relationships, but God's saying you can do different. 
you can do better. This is why we get to, to point two, and we're going to breeze through this because what time is it? Oh my goodness, we've gone so long. So five more minutes and we're done. Point number two, because this is going to set the stage for our conversation in the next couple weeks. The ultimate truth. So you have a foundational truth. Right? That marriage is God's creation. But there's an ultimate truth. And this is what, this is the trajectory of where your marriages should be heading. All right? So here's the goal. The goal for your marriage is not to, you know, achieve 73 years. The goal of your marriage is, is, is not to, you know, go travel the world together. The goal of your marriage is not to get debt free. And those things are good. But the ultimate goal of every marriage relationship ought to be this. Marriage is for God's glory. And there's three things we're going to talk about briefly. Pattern, purpose, permanence. Because believe it or not, the most powerful truth about marriage is found in Ephesians chapter 5. Look up on the screen. Here's what Paul says. This is what it's all about. This, when it all comes down to... To, to the brass nuts and bolts of things, here it is. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast. Where, where did we just read that? See, not only does Jesus affirm it, now Paul affirms it, and the two shall become one flesh. Now notice this. This mystery, write down that word, mystery, is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So what Paul does is he takes the Genesis 2 passage and explains it in a much more clear and profound way. What God is setting up in Genesis is more than your happiness. What God is setting up in Genesis is more than you know, what's comfortable for you. What, Paul, what, what Moses has set up in Genesis is what Paul now brings to completion and says, what your marriage is aimed to do is reflect Christ and the church. Now, how many of you had that in marriage counseling, premarital marriage coaching? This is what it's about. That you in your marriage relationship, the pattern is Christ's love for the church. So Bible says this, that God has kept this hidden. It's a mystery. And now he shares it with us that your marriage is more than repopulating the world. Your marriage is more than a steady societal institution. God gave marriage as a picture of Christ's love for the church. And if we treat marriage trivially, it's going to impact the gospel message of Christ's love for the church. And we wonder why evangelism and telling people about the good news of Christ seems to be falling on deaf ears in our culture. Because marriage and the demise of marriage is a picture, or it ought to be, marriage should be a picture of Christ's love for the church. That's the pattern. That's the picture. So it means the purpose now that I have with my wife, more than our happiness, more than our enjoyment of each other, is this. We have a responsibility for our marriage to be a commercial for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Marriage is designed to be the visible picture of Christ's love for the church. It is a platform for evangelism. It is a platform to tell people that there's a God who fights for us. That there's a God who says, no matter how ugly your life has been, no, much, no matter how much garbage you've accumulated in your life, there's a God who seeks us out to love us because he sends his son to die for us. Did you deserve it? No, that's grace. Did, did we deserve punishment? Yes, but he withholds that because that's mercy. But he shows us faithfulness and forgiveness and kindness. Why? Why? Because God wants to marry his people and he does it through Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Spirit, the Father, the Trinity is actively pursuing people that he's going to now marry for eternity. And now those of us who know him now share life with somebody called a wife or a husband and now our objective is to reflect the gospel love we've received as those saved in Jesus in our marriage. This is why there are kids growing up in households where they don't see that covenant commitment love between mom and dad. 
and you think walking away from your spouse, you're going to have a good opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus with your kids when they don't even see your commitment to your wife or your husband? Ladies and gentlemen, what we do with marriage, how we treat marriage is not a trivial matter. The mystery is profound, and the reason Paul is able to say what he does is it points to the gospel. And we wonder why people aren't receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Perhaps it's because we haven't given a damn about our marriages. Amen? You fight for your partner. You love your wife. You love your husband. And you get through all the crap that's going to come our way because it's going to come. And you do it. Why? Because your aim is the glory of God. Because did he not fight through the crap to win your heart? Did he not go to the cross to save you? And you didn't deserve it. See, the moment someone says, my wife doesn't deserve it. Are you kidding me? Excuse me while I open up a can of whoop, you know what, and shove it in your face and remind you of the grace of God given to you. Amen? You tell me, the moment you do not understand your forgiveness, you know, there, there's forgiveness withheld in marriage, there's grace withheld, there's mercy withheld, and the moment a person says, they don't understand the gospel in their own heart. Because you've been given all the things by God and now you're reluctant to share it with your spouse, you don't believe the gospel. Because the moment a spouse walks away, they're pretty much saying, I've given up on the gospel. I've given up on the gospel. And here's what I praise God for, that he has not given up on us. And that's our last point, permanence. God says, I will never leave you or forsake you, amen? Who's thankful for that? And the moment someone sits there and goes, I'm going to divorce my husband or divorce my wife, I sit there and go, you can only divorce your spouse when God chooses to divorce you in Christ and walk away from you. So when that happens, you're free to divorce. So when is divorce allowable? I'm going to tell you never. Why? Because never does God divorce his people. Are you thankful for that permanent love? Are you thankful that he loves you not based upon your performance? but a pit based upon his promise because he's a covenant-keeping, covenant-making God. I'm thankful for that. And it astounds me and amazes me every day. Now, I need to be a conduit to, that my, to, to my wife the moment she upsets me, the moment she frustrates me, the moment she makes me so doggone mad. And I sit there and go, what's up with the attitude, right? Like, and I sit there and go, when has God said that to me? Yeah, Scott, what's up with the attitude? Boom face, right? Truth, you know? So when the gospel is clearly in focus and you understand what you've received through God, you are able to motor through with your problems, with your, your deficiencies, your complications, whatever's going on in your relationship. There is no hurt that God cannot heal with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I'm preaching. See, I went from pastor to preacher. There, that's the difference, right? Next couple weeks, we're going to talk about husbands, wives. We'll talk about this stuff in more detail. Um, I, I love marriage. And I'm going to tell you right now, marriage was never designed to make you holy. Mar I mean, make you happy, sorry. This is where my brain is here and my mouth is back. It's like marriage was never designed to make you happy. It was designed to make you holy. Marriage was never designed for it to be easy. It was designed to make it difficult so that character and integrity could be built in the relationship as individuals and as a team. It's not easy. But when it's aimed toward God, it is the most amazing thing you could ever experience. And somehow, some way, you get to taste the gospel as you persevere with that person you call husband or wife. It's truly amazing. Love you guys. Let's stand. Let's pray. If there's comments or questions, I don't want them. Give them to Ryan. Just kidding. <laughs> Send them my way. I'll try to unpack them in the weeks to come, but more. And I'm going to tell you what, next couple of weeks, I'm going to get totally transparent about my role as a husband. And, and, and I'm going to talk about Lori and, and her role as a wife and how we're trying to live this out biblically. And I hope it be an encouragement to you. None of this stuff that God has planned for us, God never asks us to do something that he's not prepared to empower us to do. Okay? Nothing is impossible with God. Amen? So everything that we're going to talk about is totally 
achievable with God's help. And that's our hope, isn't it? That God is for us and not against us. Amen. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word, your truth, Lord, for for marriage. Lord, no matter where we've been and what we've experienced, we are looking for you to heal, to bring hope. For those who have come out of households, perhaps where mom and dad didn't model marriage well, again, there, we know there's healing there. Perhaps the things, the relationships we've directly been involved in that have been hurtful and damaging, Lord, we know that there's healing in Christ there. And perhaps some of us that have not even entered into the territory of marriage yet, I pray that the, the words today have been hope-filled. Lord, thank you for the greatest picture of marriage and that we now, your church, is the bride and you are our bridegroom and you marry us through the cross. You have shown us your commitment to us and we thank you for salvation and that while this world is an engagement period and we are married, there is a wedding feast yet to come and that's what we're looking forward to. When we shall be with you for eternity, where there's no sin and there's no tears and there's no disease, but we are with you, our bridegroom, forever. Thank you, Father, for the foretaste of that now, through the Spirit and because of Christ's sacrifice. Thank you for this morning. Guide and direct our steps, Lord. May we live for your glory in all we say and do. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day, you guys. We'll see you soon, all right? Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out thechurchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.